talk about either person's most loved or hated topic today, end times. Woo! Everybody excited? Everybody loves reading Revelation, right? Everybody's favorite book of the Bible? We're not in Revelation today, but that's kind of what we think about at end times, right? We're going to talk about that in a minute, but we got to jump back two weeks ago, because last week, right, we had a guest speaker. So we're two weeks back, so we got to really dig into our memories, at least I had to. And last, two weeks ago, we finished Luke chapter 20, where Jesus had been confronted with more religious leaders trying to get him tripped up, right? They were trying to get him to stumble and say something that they could call him out on, say, see, this really isn't the Son of God, he's really a blasphemer, let's, put him in, let's punish him, right? That's what they're trying to do. And so they get into this debate that's completely comprised of riddles, right? They present a riddle, Jesus once again kind of thwarts their efforts and answers in a way that still is faithful to God and faithful to scripture, but also helps keep people happy and, and not fighting and kind of gives them kind of a, a, a simple answer that they really can't compete against again. And then he flips the script on them this time and he offers his own riddle, right? He's like, all right, you asked me a riddle, now I get to ask you one. And he stumps the religious leaders with his riddle. And what he does at the end of it is he doesn't explain the answer to his riddle. He doesn't give us the answer to his riddle. Instead, he turns this whole thing into a teachable moment where he talks to his disciples and says, Look, these religious leaders that keep trying to trip me up, they devour widows' houses and for show make lengthy prayers. These men will be punished most severely. That's how he ends this teachable moment. And how he concludes the like time with the religious leaders to trip him up. They are where they're at because they've stepped on the backs of the lowly. And because of that, they will be punished. And what he's talking about is the teachers of the law are so greedy and so self-absorbed that they're harming the lowest of society. And they're doing exactly the opposite of what Old Testament scripture has taught them to do. And taught them to be and how they're supposed to behave. Even in Old Testament scripture, before Jesus came along in human form... They were told their job is to take care of the poor, the widow, the lowly, the outcasts. That was their responsibility, and they're failing at it. And so it's this warning, this severe warning, that Jesus ends his teaching in chapter 20. And I want us to remember this cautionary tale, because in Luke chapter 21, it's going to start off with a brief encounter where we actually get to see this reality in action. In the first couple of verses, we're going to see the religious leaders and a widow up front in Jesus' story. So I want you to turn with me to Luke chapter 21, and we're going to begin in verse 1. And I want you to see the difference between these two people groups and how Jesus addresses what they are doing as he gets ready to teach inside of the temple. He's going to teach in front of those who oppose him, but before he even does that, he calls them out for the way they are behaving. And so he gets up in the temple, he sees what's happening, and Luke says this is actually a really regular practice for Jesus. He comes to the temple on Sabbath and he teaches. And normally it's been kind of the same thing we've been going over, this gospel idea, the reality of the kingdom of God, who Jesus is, and what he's come to do. But today's message is unusual. And it becomes pretty upsetting for a lot of the people who hear it, which is saying a lot because Jesus already upset a lot of people. And so I want you to follow along with Luke chapter 21 as we hear both how Jesus responds to the widow and what he says is going to happen because of these religious leaders. Read with me from Luke chapter 21, beginning in verse 1. As Jesus looked up, he saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. Truly I tell you, he said, this wid poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in all that she had to live on. And some of the disciples were remarking about how the temple was adorned with these beautiful stones and with gifts dedicated to God. But Jesus said, As for what you see here, the time will come when not one stone will be left on another. Every one of them will be thrown down. Teacher, they asked, when will these things happen and what will be the sign that they are about to take place? Jesus replied, watch out that you are not deceived. For many will come in my name claiming I am he and the time is near. Do not follow them. When you hear of wars and 
and uprisings, do not be frightened. These things must happen first, but the end will not come right away. Then he said that the nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, famines, and pestilence in various places, and fearful events and great signs from heaven. But before all this, they will seize you and persecute you. They will hand you over to synagogues and put you in prison, and you will be brought before kings and governors, all and all on account of my name. And so you will bear testimony to me. But make up yourself your mind not to worry beforehand how you will defend yourselves. For I give you I will give you words and wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to resist or contradict. You will be betrayed even by parents, brothers, and sisters, relatives, and friends, and they will put some of you to death. Everyone will hate you because of me, but not a hair on your head will perish. Stand firm and you will win life. When you see Jerusalem being surrounded by armies, you will know that its desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, let those in the city get out, and let those in the country not enter the city. For this is the time of punishment and fulfillment of all that has been written. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. They will be great disasters in the land and wrath among against this people. They will fall by the sword and will be taken as prisoners to all the nations. Jerusalem will be trampled on by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles are fulfilled. There will be signs of the sun, moon, and stars on the earth. Nations will be in anguish and perplexed at the roaring and tossing at the sea. People will faint from terror, apprehension of what is coming in the world, for the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, we will, they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when they see these things being, begin to take place, stand up and lift up your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. And so he told them this parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. When they sprout leaves, you can see for yourselves and know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that the kingdom of God is near. Truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. So be careful, or your hearts will be weighed down with kerosene, drunkenness, and anxieties of life. And that day will close on you suddenly, like a trap. For it will come on all those who live on the face of the whole earth. So be always on the watch, and pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen, and that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. Each day Jesus was teaching at the temple, and each evening he went out to spend the night on the hill called Mount of Olives. And all the people came early in the morning to hear him at the temple. This is the word of the Lord. Anybody feel warm and fuzzy after that one? Right? Sounds, yeah. sounds like a good time, right? Not really, right? We don't really like, like I said, it's either a love or hate with the end time conversation because it never sounds fun, right? The end time is not going to be pleasant for a lot of people. And so here we find Jesus and he's surrounded by his disciples and he's in the temple getting ready to do what he does best. He's getting ready to teach the people yet again. And we hear, even there at the end, this is a regular practice for him. Every night he goes out and he prays and he has some time by himself. Every morning he comes back and he teaches. He's getting ready to have his journey to the cross. He knows his time is near. And so he needs to get his message across as often and as in your face as you can. And so he goes into this ritual of coming into the temple, even though he knows all of these leaders hate him at this point. Pretty much all of them are trying to get him punished or even killed. But he comes in anyway because he knows that's his mission. And so he's in the temple. He's just had this encounter with these religious leaders. He's in there getting ready to teach once again. And he looks up and he sees this really disheartening scene unfold in front of him. Remember, he had just warned his disciples in the previous chapter that these religious leaders took for themselves... And we're greedy and selfish, all at the expense of the widows and the lowest in society. These religious leaders had failed to do what God had told them to do in the Old Testament, to fail to care for the poor. And there, in the front of the temple, in the house of God, where Jesus, where God's commandment should have been lived out so fully.
fully, he sees the reality of the situation. And he looks up, and everyone's giving their offering, right? They're coming, they're bringing their sacrifices and their money to the temple. And he looks up, and he sees all these finely dressed religious leaders, right? They have the best clothes, they're fancy, they're important. People look at them and go, wow, aren't they great? They're full of pomp and circumstance, and they take their large money, and they make a big show of putting it into the offering plate. Knowing that everyone is looking at them with awe and declaring what pious and godly men they are for their great gifts that they've brought to the temple. And even in their offering, it's a selfish act because they're not there to give it to God. They're not trying to do it as an act of worship. They're doing it as an act of, look at me. Look at all the great things I have and look at how holy and perfect I am. Look at me. It's a selfish act. And it's working. Right, everybody's focused on these religious leaders. They're going, wow, look at them. Aren't they so great? Aren't they so godly? But behind them comes this widow. One no one would have paid any attention to. In fact, the disciples don't even notice her until Jesus calls her out. But he excitedly says, look at her. Right, she's not calling attention to herself, but Jesus says, look at her. See her. As she puts two simple copper coins. Basically the equivalent of us putting a couple pennies in the offering plate. I mean, that money isn't going to make a big difference for the temple. It's not going to buy new robes. It's not going to help with keeping the, anybody in business. It's not going to work on anything. It's not going to do much by worldly standards. It's not going to get her any attention either. In fact, nobody would have noticed her if Jesus hadn't been there. But he says, look at that widow because she gave everything. She is the true embodiment of the kingdom of God. She has given more so much more than any of those religious leaders because she was so faithful to God that she gave everything she had to live on as an act of worship. Look at her. Now, of course, as we've learned in the gospel, the disciples come out looking kind of foolish in this response, right? Jesus is saying, look at her, look at what she's given. And what do they comment on? They start praising the temple. They go, well, look at these ornate decorations. Look at this lovely building. Look at the structure. Look at everything. Can you imagine how much wealth has gone into building this temple? Right? They must think that Jesus' comment has to do with giving money to the temple. Right? They think that's what he's talking about. They're only seeing it at face value. They're going, okay, we're supposed to give money to the temple. We're supposed to give all that we have. Right? And look at how great and grand this temple is. It must need a lot of money. They miss what's really being said by Jesus focusing on the structure around them. But what Jesus is saying is that the kingdom of God is this reality where the poor are honored, where the powerless rule over the powerful, where faithful women like the widow brings shame to the greedy men of the, like the Pharisees. It's a reality where the marginalized supersede the religious elite and the lowly are given first place. This is what the kingdom of God is, where the low are brought up, and those who pride themselves are made low. Jesus is saying that the kingdom of God is where the last are made first, and the poor are raised up. But all the disciples can do, as Jesus is making this powerful statement, is look around them at the man-made splendor and marvel at what the great cost it must have been. And so Jesus, being Jesus, enters teacher mode again. He goes, all right, we're, we're missing the point here. Let's talk about it. And once again, he creates this teachable moment for his disciples because they lack understanding. And so he begins by this really shocking statement. He goes, yeah, look at, look at all of this temple. Look at this impressive structure, everything you're marveling at. A day is coming in the very near future where not one stone of its walls will be left stacked on top of another. A time is coming where this very temple that you are so enamored with will be completely and utterly destroyed. Right? That's going to get the disciples' attention. It's going to get a lot of people's attention. And so naturally, the disciples, they want to know when this horrible event is going to happen. The next question is, okay, when? God, what, will, what are the signs? How will we know this is going to happen? They want to be prepared and they want to be able to avoid this whole situation altogether. And so they turn to Jesus and say, when? When, Lord, will this happen? And Jesus uses that question to prophesy. 
He tells of civil and political unrest, of hunger and death, of storms and famines, of persecution and hardship. He talks about all of these horrible things that were going to happen before the destruction of the temple. But he concludes it with, don't worry. Don't worry because God will guide them on what to say and what to do when these times come. And God will redeem them when all of it is through. God is still active even when this horrible thing happens in the future. Now it's important to take a moment to really think about what Luke's audience is hearing. Because we've talked about this before. Luke's audience is a little bit different than Matthew and Mark's audience because he is a second generation. He's working with people who aren't the ones who walked with Jesus. They're the next generation. And because of that, they're also ones who've already seen the reality of this prophecy. You see, there are similar texts in Matthew and Mark of when Jesus predicted the destruction of the temple, but it hadn't happened yet. Those were written before 70 AD where the temple was actually destroyed. And so in their passage, there's a lot more uncertainty and more speculation about what Jesus is actually saying. They don't really know the fullness of what he's talking about. However, for Luke and his audience, these people lived it. They had first and second hand accounts of Jesus' prophecies happening in real time. They are on the other side of these events, looking back at Jesus' teachings and realizing that everything Jesus said, everything he said would happen, all the prophecies he made... They've already come to pass. There is no mistake that Jesus was the real prophet in that moment. And he truly was speaking for God. And so here we have an audience who's seen the reality of Jesus' prophecy. And as Jesus speaks about what will be for the temple, Luke's audience is picturing real events. As they read the destruction and everything that would happen prior, they are remembering their history. Jesus said the temple would be destroyed so severely that not one stone would be left on top of another. And Luke's audience witnessed the walls of the temple being literally ripped down. They witnessed everything that was wood be set on fire. And they heard about thousands of Jews who were killed at the hands of the Romans. Maybe they even knew some of them personally. Jesus warned his disciples that many would come saying they were the Messiah. He cautioned them to stay wary and alert and to not fall for their blatant lies. And again, Luke's audience recalls how many of the Jewish leaders led revolt after revolt. And they led people into what caused the destruction of the temple. Because they claimed to be the Messiah. They promised to do exactly what the Jews wanted the Messiah to do. Right? We talked about this. They didn't like Jesus because he wasn't the Messiah they wanted. They wanted a Messiah who was going to come and tear Rome down. And so these guys promised to do that. And they followed him. But what Luke's audience knows is that those lies and the deceit ended in bloodbath. And Jesus even warned his disciples to run from this coming conflict. And he prophesied about this place that would be a refuge for those fleeing the city. He told them where to go. And those reading Luke's account during this, when it was written, remember the city of Pella. It was a Gentile city in the Decapolis where we talked about a long time ago where the first missionary was sent. A man who had been possessed by demons. They went to that city. They were provided refuge for those who fled the Romans as they led siege to the city of Jerusalem. So unlike the readers of Matthew and Mark who read this account, Luke's audience doesn't have to be convinced that Jesus' prophecy will come true. Luke isn't trying to say, this is true, this is going to happen, you need to be worried. They lived it. They experienced it. They were first-hand witnesses of Jesus' prophecy in action. So they know everything prophesied happened exactly as Jesus warned them it would. They know Jesus is who he said he is. Just like today, we can look back on history and we see Jesus' prophecy unfold. There are accounts not only in Jewish culture, but in the Roman culture and in other places of this horrid event happening. We can see it. We can read about it. We can learn about it. And Luke's audience was right there with us. They knew that this prophecy had come true. However, this kind of sense of incompleteness also lays through Jesus' prophecy. While we can point to a specific time in history of Jesus' prophecy of the destruction of the temple, we can see where that happened. We have accounts of it occurring. Jesus doesn't end his prophecy there. Instead, he goes into talking about the return of the Son of Man. And the finality of the coming of the kingdom of God. 
And as we read through this chapter in Luke, we get this sense of an already and not yet dichotomy of Jesus' prophecy. We already talked about this idea with the kingdom of God, of it being already here but not yet fully realized. And that's kind of what this prophecy is, too. Some of what Jesus had said has already happened. Luke's audience already knows about part of it. The temple's already been destroyed, and Jewish Christians have fled the surrounding cities. But the Son of Man hasn't returned yet. God's kingdom has not been fully realized. And this is the part of Jesus' prophecy that we really need to dive into today. Because it's, what's, because it's a warning and also instruction to us as much as it was the disciples 2,000 years ago. We don't have to worry about the destruction of the temple, but, whatever, but all the other stuff Jesus said, we're still waiting on. And we need to focus on that. And so Jesus says, one day the Son of Man will return in the clouds and there to look up and know redemption is near. One day the kingdom of heaven will be fully realized and those who remain faithful will get to see the fullness of God in that time. But this future reality, the one that sounds a little bit better than everything else Jesus prophesied, right? Redemption over destruction always sounds like a better option. This future comes with a warning. Jesus says, be ready. Be on the lookout. Keep watch. Always be alert for when the Son of Man returns because if they don't, if they don't continue to prepare themselves and to watch and be ready and alert, the pressures, the temptations, the anxiety of this life will overpower them. They will get so focused on what's going on in this life, on this earth, that when the day of the, comes and the Son of Man returns, it won't be that day of redemption that Jesus is promising. It will rather be a day of entrapment, where they feel trapped and imprisoned because they were focusing on the wrong thing. And this closing statement of Jesus' teaching is what we need to focus on today. Because just as much as Luke's audience and Jesus' audience needed to hear what he said back then when it was first written, we need to hear it too. Because we are still waiting for the Son of Man to return. Now this destruction of the temple kickstarted this new era for God's people. And it's, we see this pattern, right? No longer was God's presence found at the temple. No longer were the Jews the only people of God. When the Romans laid siege to Jerusalem and the Jewish Christians fled, what they did is they took the gospel with them. As a result of the chaos and the turmoil and the persecution and everything going on in Jerusalem, the church was born. Out of chaos, the church came into existence as it spread throughout all nations. If you read Luke's second book, Acts, we will see how Jesus' prophecies led to the spreading of the gospel. To Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth, just as Jesus said it would, and just as Jesus said they should, in Acts 1.8. So out of this unthinkable event, the new age, the age of intervention, began. The temple was destroyed, but the end of the world had not come, praise be to God, because instead, God provided a time for everyone to hear the good news of Jesus. He gave us an opportunity to repent and to turn towards God, a time where all nations and peoples and cultures and generations could choose to follow Christ. This in between, this intervention time, this time of learning and spreading and sharing, that's the time we're living in currently. That's the time we get to participate in. That's where we find ourselves in history. We're still in this season of intervention before the kingdom of God is fully realized, and we are held, all held accountable for the choices we make during this time. And so with that understanding... With realizing where we are in history and what our role is, it's important for us to look at Jesus' final instructions to his disciples and understand how we are supposed to live into those in our present day. And so the first thing we learn is that we're not to be weighed down by the drunkenness and anxieties of this life. And while Jesus at times does speak about literal drunkenness, Jesus is more speaking broadly about overindulgence in the pleasures or the things that tempt us in this life. Basically, Jesus is saying it can be really easy to get so caught up in either the good or the bad things that this life has to offer that we lose sight of what we are ultimately supposed to be focusing on. There are so many things in this life that call for our attention, and not all of them are bad if we indulge in moderation. However, it can be really easy for those things to become our main focus. To the point where we no longer keep watch for the return of the Son of Man because we're so focused watching and what's happening right here in front of our face. A good example of this is if you, if you know of someone who has struggled with addiction, 
with alcoholism or drug abuse or anything else, you know that the very idea of their addiction consumes them. Right? They live their lives so focused on consuming their addiction, getting the next hit, or figuring out how they're going to get more of whatever they're addicted to, or maybe feeling guilty for indulging in that addiction. Everything in their life, everything in their world revolves around whatever this item, this thing they're addicted to is. Whether it's having it now, getting more in the future, or feeling bad about it from the past. It's their whole world. It's their whole focus. It's all they can think about. And similarly, when we encounter bad things, they also kind of consume us in that way. Our every waking moment is focused on those bad things. I know I've talked about this some, but when Jonathan was one month old, he ended up in ICU with pneumonia. For three days, my entire world was consumed with watching my baby boy being hooked up to all sorts of monitors, being poked with all sorts of needles, and being checked by all sorts of doctors. And as a result of this experience, I developed a very real problem with anxiety that resulted in these all-consuming attacks where I could focus on nothing else but my fear of what was going to happen to my son. And I can honestly speak from experience when I say that in the middle of my anxiety attacks, nothing else penetrated my thoughts. I couldn't focus on anything but this overwhelming sense of dread and panic. And that's what Jesus is warning us against. And while all our responses to negative things may not be as severe as my response to that moment in my life, we're all still kind of prone to focusing on the negative. I mean, think back in your life. Think of all the times people have commented on you or what you do or how you look or how you speak or anything like that. How many of you can quote a genuine compliment someone gave you? How many of you can think back and think of the good things people have said about you? You might think, oh, I remember someone encouraged me or I remember someone said something nice about me, but can you actually quote it? What about a negative comment? Can you quote something negative someone said about you? Can you think of a time where someone said something bad about you and all you could do is focus on that one comment? There are actually studies out there that say that if you tell someone 100 things and 99 of them are good and one of them are bad, they won't remember the 99. They'll focus on the one bad. That's our world. That's what we're told to focus on. That's what Jesus is warning us against. The same with major events in our lives. We might have good memories, but a lot of times the bad ones are the ones that stick out to us. Easier to recall the bad times than the good. And that's because this world and the brokenness in it calls us to hold fast to the bad things. To focus on how life isn't fair or how we've been treated poorly. And just like an addiction can be all-consuming, this focus on the problems of this life can consume us to the point where we no longer even see Jesus. We no longer can tell that the Son of Man has returned because we're so focused on the bad things and the addictions that consume us. So Jesus says, if you want to be able to see the Son of Man, if you want to participate in the return of Christ, if you want to engage in the fullness of the kingdom of God, we can't get bogged down by these things. We can't be trapped by either the good things that we overindulge in or the bad things of this life to the point where our vision is blocked to seeing Christ. And so he says, place Jesus at the center of your life. Let Jesus block out all the worldly things that try to consume us so that when we, so we can always be on the watch for the return of the Son of Man. Along with this, Jesus says that if we keep watch for the Son of Man, we will escape the calamities of the end times. When Jesus returns, it will be our time of redemption and restoration, and we should be anxiously waiting for that time. The Christian Jews at the time of the destruction of the temple faced a major civil war where families were torn apart because some were not keeping watch for what was happening around them. The Jewish Christians knew Jesus had told them to flee. They knew what was going to lead to this destructive time, and they kept watch. And they refused to participate in all of these false prophets and false messiahs' leadings. And as the other Jews geared up to do everything Jesus told them not to do, as they geared up to attack Rome and try to overthrow them, the other Jewish Christians decided to hang back, to not engage. And it caused a civil war and a civil unrest. And because of all of this, all those things Jesus said would come to pass, all the things Jesus prophesied, the Christians were able to flee and were spared, while those who refused to listen to Christ suffered at the hands of the Romans. 
And similarly, we are told to keep watch so that we don't get fooled in the unrest and brokenness of this world. That we don't get hung up on the consequences that will come to those who choose to ignore Christ and will, and will suffer consequences when the Son of Man returns. If we keep watch, if we avoid getting distracted by the temptations and trials of this world, then we will get to experience the fullness of the restoration. We will get to participate when the Son of Man returns. We will find restoration. We will find redemption. If we choose to not follow Christ, we'll find entrapment. What this means is we have to actively be living into the kingdom of God daily. We have to be seeking to bring God's kingdom to earth as it is in heaven every single day so that on that day we can stand tall knowing we were watching and ready for this day to occur. We have to be like the widow who gave everything she had out of faithfulness and not like the religious leaders who gave only to gain. This leads us to our final thing we need to be paying attention to in Jesus' warnings, and that's that we need to live the lives that will allow us to stand before the Son of Man with confidence when we stand before Christ. If Jesus were to walk into the sanctuary today, and you looked at him, and you knew without a shadow of a doubt that he knew everything in your heart and your mind right now, and he knew all that you had done and planned to do, could you look him in the eyes? Could you stand and receive his praise of well done, good, good and faithful servant if he came in right now and looked you in the eyes? This is what Jesus is calling his disciples to. He's saying, be ready. A time is coming, and it's not one that you can predict. It's not one you're going to see coming. It's not one you can say, it'll happen tomorrow so I can live how I want today. We don't know when the Son of Man will appear, but we're going to be held accountable to him when he does. One day Jesus will come back, and we will be called to stand before him. And Jesus is asking, will you be able to stand before me on that day? Will you know with confidence that you live the life God called you to live? I had a youth pastor explain it to me like this once. He said, if you're about to do something that you're not sure about, you're not sure if you should do, imagine Jesus sitting next to you as you do it. Picture him looking over your shoulder, participating in what it is you want to participate in. And imagine his face as he experiences what you are doing. What's his face look like as he witnesses you doing this action. If you feel comfortable with Jesus hanging out with you while you do it, it's probably an okay activity. Probably fine. However, if you don't want Jesus at your side while you're doing whatever it is you're doing, you probably shouldn't be doing it. And while we know that Jesus is always present and with us, we can often overlook it because we don't see his physical presence before us. We forget that he's there and we think we're doing things in secret. But one day, we're going to be called to stand face to face with Christ. We're going to be called to give an account of our lives. And when Jesus calls us to him, we need to be able to stand in confidence knowing we lived into who he called us to be. What Jesus is calling us to do is live a life where we can do whatever we can do that. Where we can stand confidently knowing that we live lives of purity. And so as we close, I want us to acknowledge that this passage, and many like it, as I started this sermon with, are wrapped up in this heated debate of the end times. And you can find thousands of books that try to look at this prophecy and many others through Scripture and try to pinpoint exactly what will happen at the end time and how we'll know what will happen and when it's going to happen and what are the signs. And you can get lost in all sorts of conversations about the end time. In fact, lots of really smart people have tried to explain and understand what this point in history will look like. And how we can be prepared. And there's nothing wrong with what they're doing. It's fascinating, really, and can be really entertaining to read. However, we can get so focused on the details, so focused on trying to solve the end time puzzle, that we miss what Jesus is really calling us to in this passage. Saying, always be on the watch. Always be ready for the Son of Man to return. Always live in such a way that you won't be ashamed of Jesus walking in on what you're doing. No matter where you fall on this debate of the end times, no matter how much you know or think you understand or don't want to talk about it or don't want to think about it, we do know one thing for certain. Jesus is coming back. Jesus will return, and when he does, the kingdom of God will be fully realized. 
And so it's our job in this in-between time to live out God's kingdom, to share the gospel with everyone we encounter so that when that day comes, and when we stand before Christ, he will look at us and say, well done, good and faithful servant. Well done. You lived always watching the Son of Man, and you lived into who Christ called you to be. Well done. And as we look forward to that re reality, and as we reassess our lives to determine if we're really living lives that are truly in line with what he's calling us to be, I want us to ask ourselves, what do we need to do to be ready and watching? What do you need to change? What do you need to do more of? What do you need to do less of? What kind of help do you need to get so that you can avoid all the distractions, the addictions, the things of this world saying, focus on me so we can focus on Christ? What needs to change? And as you think about this question, I want to invite you to stand and receive a benediction of prayer over you and over me and over all of us from Ephesians chapter 1 and 2. And as Paul writes, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance and his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Far above all rule and authority, power and dominion in every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. But because of God's great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Amen. Amen. Go in peace.